The Top Kirk Moments. This is episode 49. You're listening to 70s Trek with Bob Turner and Kelly Casco. The fan podcast that looks at Star Trek in the 1970s. It was the decade that built a franchise. This week, we're talking about our favorite moments on Star Trek centered around Captain James T. Kirk. I'm Bob Turner. And I'm Kelly Casto. As the captain of the Enterprise and the main character on the show, he had a lot of great scenes and picking our favorite wasn't easy. But before we do that, let's remind everyone how they can reach us. You can visit our Facebook page at facebook.com slash 70s Trek and leave us a question or a comment there. You sure can. And we will get back to you, too. You can also send us an email to 70s Trek at gmail.com or find the show at iTunes by searching 70s Trek in the podcast section. When you leave a rating or a review, it actually helps other people find the show. He's heroic, he's bold, he's brash, and he's unflappable. But he is definitely not forgettable. For three seasons, William Shatner played Captain Kirk. He and the writers created some very memorable on-screen moments. Absolutely. So what we're going to do this week is go through our top five Kirk moments and maybe offer a couple of honorable mentions as well. Kelly, do you want to go ahead and start with your number five? Sure. I'm going to start with the conscience of the king. And what I want to talk about with um, Kirk here is how he can basically try and, I don't know, seduce any woman <laughs> that's out there. And, you know, s- sorry for being uh, blunt, but even the nutbag that he was trying to romance on this episode. Again, he was doing it to try and get information to see if he was her, her dad was actually the notorious war criminal. Yeah, right. Exactly. He doesn't even it's not necessarily that he even tries. The man <laughs> succeeds. Yes. Yes, he does. It shows that he's going to use anything in his toolbox to get what he's looking for. (laughs) There you go. I like that a lot. (laughs) Well, my number five is from the episode Arena. First of all, that's just one of my most favorite episodes. But what I really love about that that episode is when Kirk looks like he's beaten. You know, he's got a, a banged up leg. The Gorn is obviously physically stronger and at least as intelligent. We think he's at least as intelligent as Captain Kirk is. That is until Kirk realizes the resources around him can be used to make a cannon. Watching Shatner show Kirk as that moment dawns on him. Oh, my God, that's right. You know, his high school chemistry comes back to him. And he realizes what he can do with sulfur, what he can do with coal. He can make gunpowder. He can use the diamonds as projectiles. He finds a hollow bamboo shoot, creates the cannon. It was brilliant. It was. Yeah. And I mean, and again, it shows that he's resourceful. Yes, very much. Tell me about your number four. Uh, My next one is the Corbomite Maneuver. Great episode. Oh, yeah. And, you know, so what sticks out at me is Kirk is, you know, a Starfleet captain. And he got that way as and one of the youngest captains for a reason. And in this case, you know, he's he's faced with this superior opponent and he's basically got nothing left to throw at him and except for bluffing. Right. And and that leads to. You know, that works and um, actually kind of leads to, uh, uh, you know, learning about a new civilization, you know, with Balok and everything. And it's a great counterpoint to Spock, who, being logical and, and referring to chess, 
He says to Kirk, checkmate, the game's up. When right. you're in checkmate, there's you have no more alternatives. And Kirk's like, really? Is that your best recommendation? Right. And he, he's it, like, it, no, we're playing poker here, not chess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just, it shows you the great, uh, a great dichotomy between Kirk and Spock and, and the two personalities. Right. Well, my number four was the ultimate computer. And, and there's a moment in that episode where Kirk has been made to feel useless. The computer is doing everything that Kirk yeah. could do, and it, it's carrying out the orders and making the ship turn and putting up shields and all of those things that it did. And Kirk feels unimportant, not needed. And he's in his quarters, and it looks like he's just finding something to occupy his mind. And McCoy comes in. And we've kind of talked about this moment in the past. But Kirk gets wistful. He gets, you know, he 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 is thinking about his role and and gee, what what was it like, you know, when you sailed on the ocean in wooden sailing ships and you know, you felt the wind and at your back and you felt the spray of the ocean. And he just sort of gets sentimental for a moment. And we see these glimpses, and they are, they're just tiny little glimpses into Captain Kirk's personality that, yeah, he's a big, bold, really good starship captain, but there's a part of him who's also a bit of a romantic and yeah. maybe even wishes he was somewhere else. Right. And, and I love those little moments. I'm, that's one of the reasons this show means as much to me as it does, those little moments. And that's, that's one of my favorites. Well, and, and don't you think, like with Corbomite Maneuver and poker, and and like you're talking about the romanticism of sailing on a ship and being a captain on the seas, that they carry that through Star Trek they the do. whole way. They do. I, actually, one of the things I love the most about Wrath of Khan, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, is in his apartment, as he and Bones are talking, he's got a collection of antiques. Yeah, And his love for the past and that romanticism, it even plays all the way through Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Right. What is your number three? All right. Uh, my number three is Balance of Terror. So now we've talked about this episode before, and you can you know this is one of my favorites. I, I just love the chess, chess match with the uh, Romulan uh, commander. It's just... And, you know, now we're playing chess, right? Not poker. Right. Um, I just, I really like, you know, Kirk used, again, all his resources to stay one step ahead of this guy, or at least, you know, trying to keep up with him. And then ultimately wins, even though the Romulan commander had the um, advantage, really, with a cloak ship with this brand new superior weapon and Kirk uses all of his knowledge and uh, resources to basically uh, create an echo or a mirror of the, the Romulan ship, you know? So he, he's, again, he's using all this strategy, and it's, it's all very bold strategy to try and get the advantage. Yeah, I thought that the two captains, both Kirk and the Romulan commander, are very well matched. And yes. and it's very cool at the end of the episode when the, when the Romulan commander tells him, you know, in a different reality, I could have called you a friend because he recognizes that. Exactly. And, and somewhere along the line, as Kirk and the Romulan are playing cat and mouse, Kirk realizes, I need to go off script. I need to, because we are so evenly matched, this guy knows what I'm, what I'm going to do next. Right. I got to try something else. And exactly. he does. And, it, and that's when he finally gets him. And the, uh, the other part of this uh, episode was very human, where, you know, he's getting ready to marry Lieutenant Tomlinson and yeah. Angela. Yeah. And, you know, red alert, and they got to go before they get married. And Tomlinson dies. And <laughs> he comforts Angela, at, you know, in the wedding chapel. Yeah, that, that moment showed how much of a caring leader he is. Exactly. Good stuff. Very yeah. good stuff. What was your third one? My third one was the Doomsday Machine. Oh, yeah. During that episode, um, Kirk does a lot of cool stuff, and he's, you know, he's trapped aboard the Constellation. There's a lot of different things happening. But the moment that I like the best 
is as he's decided to use the constellation basically as a bomb, and he's going to run it right down the throat of that doomsday machine. And he's got a timed out, and he's got it set on course, and it's heading for the mouth of that thing. And you hear that click, click, click <laughs> of the timer, and we all know there's no clicking timers no. <laughs> in the 23rd century. <laughs> but that's okay. We'll let that That's go. all right. It was dramatic effect. It was a dramatic effect. So we know time's ticking away, and the transporter aboard the Enterprise, boom, isn't working. And Kirk pulls, you know, he hits the red button, pulls out the communicator and says, beam me aboard. Uh, We can't. The transporter's down. And they cut to his face, and it's kind of like, he doesn't say it, but you see it. Oh, shit. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) And so Scotty's in the Jeffries tube. Spock's on the intercom telling Scotty, try whatever. You know, time is of the essence, Mr. Scott. Mr. Scott. And Kirk is standing there frozen with his communicator in his hand. (laughs) Gentlemen, I suggest you beam me aboard. (laughs) He was very calm. He was incredibly calm, unflappable, which is why I love that moment. Because quite frankly, I think I would have been pooping myself. (laughs) Uh, yeah. The seconds are ticking away. You're under 10. You know you're either going to die from the explosion or from going in, inside the mouth of that thing. Either way, you're you're about to die. Right. And there he is. Gentlemen, I suggest you beam me aboard. And it, it, it just carries so much along with it, but there's very little emotion. And right. I love that. That's it, classic Kirk. It is classic. How about you? What was your number two? Number two, okay. City on the Edge of Forever. So I'm going to, I mean, this is, we all know this is a great episode. Uh, and there's a lot to love about this. But just want to focus on Kirk at the, towards the very end when Edith is walking out in the street. He's stopping Bones from going and, and saving her. She dies and, and you could just see on his face, he was just devastated. That human side of him and how he could care for somebody that much, but then knew what to do for the greater good. Right. Absolutely. You don't get any closer to crying in Star Trek than that moment. Not at all. That really sort of wrenches uh, the emotion out of you. Uh, Even my wife, like when that happened, the first time she watched it, she grabbed my forearm. That's not my wife. She doesn't do things like that. <laughs> but she grabbed my forearm, and that was because she was so shocked by that moment. You know, it, it even like it even hit her deep. And she's not a big fan of the show like we are. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. that was a big deal. This will end up on my um, my Nimoy one too. So <laughs> absolutely, when when McCoy says, "Jim, I could have saved her. Do you know what you just did?" And Spock turns to McCoy and says, he knows, doctor. He knows. Oh, my God. And then I'm guessing this is also part of your favorite moment because when they finally come back through the Guardian and they all sort of line up and, and, you know, Kirk says, let's get the hell out of here. Yep. That that disgust, that sadness. Just all those emotions he had. I mean, it was so many different emotions. Yeah. He, He pulled it off. Shatner nails it, he I did. think, in just the way he says that. Let's get the hell out of here. And that's all he's got to do. That's all he's got to say. There weren't any big movements. There weren't any big, you know, it wasn't a big production about it at all. That's all he said. And you knew. Whoa. You knew. Wow. Yep. You were, I remember the first time seeing that, and I was kind of like taken aback by it as a kid in the 70s. You're like, whoa. Right. Yeah, me too. Yeah. That was a big deal. That was your number two? Uh, Yeah. What's your number two? My number two is probably Return to Tomorrow. And if you remember, that's the episode where they come across the orbs. Yeah. And there are three life forms left over. Sargon is one of them, the leader, you know. And they would like to borrow the bodies of Kirk and Spock and um, another character played by Diana Mulder. She's back in it. I can't remember her name. Do you remember her name in this episode? 
Okay, no, it doesn't sorry. matter because we're talking about Captain Kirk, so let's move on. Right. And everybody's kind of giving Kirk static. No, we shouldn't do it, McCoy, saying it's too risky. We shouldn't do it. And he has the speech. Risk. Risk is our business. That's what this starship is all about. That's why we're aboard her. Yeah, I love that. It defines the whole series. It does. It just tells you everything about the show that you want to know. And, and it's that the fact that it's buried in the middle of the second season is kind of a shame because the boy, that, that really should have been like the first episode. Right. It's a great moment. And uh, again, you know, Shatner pulls it off. Yeah, that was one of my honorable mentions. Was it? Yes. Awesome. How about your first? All right. My first. And again, this is my favorite episode. Trouble with Tribbles. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and just uh, Barris and his attitude towards incompetent bureaucrats. Just, uh, you know, I frankly probably live with that day in and day out <laughs> with work. Um, but, you know, it just he just nailed it of, oh, my gosh, you're calling me to, you know, uh, K7 for a priority one distress call. This isn't. For Miss some shoes. wheat? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so he's just livid with Barris from the moment he got there through the whole thing. He's just disgusted with him. Oh, yeah. And, and, and he put, he, you know, this is the defining quote from uh, from that um, episode with and his attitude towards Barris. I've never questioned the orders or the intelligence of any representative of the Federation until now. <laughs> so, I love it. <laughs> I do too. So uh, there are lots of other um, things I'd bring up, but that, that just nailed it for me. I agree. That's a, that's a really big moment. My number one moment is in the naked time. And this is a very early episode in the first season. This episode was designed to, open these characters up so you would get a chance as a viewer to see who they are inside. And it's a brilliant writing. And if you remember, it's the episode where there's some kind of contagion or virus that is passed from person to person when they touch each other. And it, al it acts like alcohol in the bloodstream and it, their inhibitions are gone. And uh, for example, you know, when Sulu is touched, he, always thinks of himself as a bit of a musketeer, and so he's running <laughs> right. around the corridors with a sword. <laughs> and his shirt off. And his shirt off, yeah, right. Spock begins to doubt himself. Those doubts that he keeps buried, well, now his inhibitions are gone, and those doubts come pouring out, and he's flooded with emotion. When, when Kirk goes to find him, because, oh, by the way, the engines have been shut off by another drunk crew member. Um, he needs Spock to help Scotty, he touches Spock, and now he's infected. And what comes out of Kirk? Kirk begins to look around the ship, and he's like, now I know why they call her she. She won't permit me my life. I've got to live hers. Right. You know, why can't I just have a moment with no braid on my shoulder, walk on the beach with a beautiful woman? And it's a really telling scene about the conflict of where he's at, because in a moment, after Spock kind of has this insight of how this whole thing might work, Kirk switches, and he looks around the room again, and he says, I'll never lose you. Never. Yes. Yep. And he goes from these two extremes of you, Enterprise, you're killing me, to I love you, and I'll do everything I can to hold on to you. Right. And it made the Enterprise... A oh, character. It really, really did. I so agree with you because from that moment on through the whole series, if you watch it, you do think the Enterprise is, is kind of this special thing. It is more special than the other ships in the fleet. It has this undefinable quality. It always comes through. Right. And this is, I think you're right, this is where it's born in this episode. The next part of this scene really resonates with me because he tells Scotty and Spock, clear the corridors. In other words, I'm the captain. I need to appear indestructible. Get everybody out of the way. They can't see me like this. And they clear the corridor so, so he can leave the briefing room and head to the bridge. 
And he, you can see as he's walking down the hall, he's trying to pull it together. And he gets into the, the turbo lift and he turns around and somebody had written sinner repent on the wall, right? <laughs> right, right. And it was kind of like a slap across the face to him because there's, there's a close up of him. He, he had been bleeding on the side of his mouth and he takes his fist and he just wipes that blood away. And you can tell Kirk's back. Yeah. And that's that shot, that shot of him kind of aggressively wiping the blood off the corner of his mouth. I've always remembered that. It it's my number one Kirk moment. Because against all odds, when he's when he's feeling vulnerable and he's, you know, emotional and he's not himself, he's pulling it together because he knows he has to. Right. Love that moment. I right, that's yeah, that is awesome. So I've got a few honorable mentions. Do you? You want to tell me one of your honorable mentions? Well, I so I've got Amok Time as an honorable mention. And really, again, this is probably more of a, a Nimoy um, episode, but just Kirk stepping up. I know, you know, he was chosen by Dupring to uh, fight uh, Spock, you know, as, as her champion. And then he later finds out it's a fight to the death. But he doesn't waver. Right. It, he, you know, he knows he's got to do this for his friend. And then, you know, there's also the Bones has a moment where he gives Kirk the shot um, because he knows he's got to save both his friends. Right. The triad of those three just watching out for each other and taking care of each other. Um, just as I love that moment just for the three of those. Yes, and just to sort of dovetail off of that, you know, there's that other moment where Kirk's got the slash across his chest, his shirt's ripped open, he's having a hard time breathing, and Bones gives him a shot, and he says, you're going to have to kill him, Jim. And Kirk says, kill Spock? That's not why we came to Vulcan, is it? Right. Right. Uh, do you, I've got uh, an honorable mention. Uh, let me start with, with this one. Kirk is Romulan in the Enterprise incident. That's it. That's all. Kirk with yeah. pointed ears walking around the Romulan ship. That's pretty cool. How about you? Do you have another honorable mention? Um, I, I no, not really. I mean, I have one that's probably more more for uh, Michelle and, and Uhura. You know, the first kiss in Plato's step ch- hey, children. Hey, it's a Kirk moment. That's legit. It's, they're is one spot though that I'm not so happy about and it's the humiliation that the crew goes through, including Kirk, you know, where they're controlling him and making him do things and, you know, Alexander riding him like a horse. And that's know. that's what's really wrong with this entire episode, isn't it? <laughs> right. Yeah. So I agree with you there. I have a couple of more things, not many, that I want to mention real quick in the changeling and the return of the Archons. Kirk uses logic to outsmart logical machines. I love that. I, I love too. that. He gets them both basically to blow up just by using, you know, logic. You're bad. You're supposed to do away with badness. Do away with it now then. Yeah. And illogical. You're right, exactly. And in the yeah. episode Who Mourns for Adnaeus, at the very end of that episode where Apollo's had enough and he throws himself onto the winds and disappears. You know, Bones says, I wish we didn't have to do this. And Kirk agrees and talks about what the Greeks and the Greek gods had given us. And then he says, kind of wistfully at the end there, would it have hurt us, I wonder, just to have gathered a few laurel leaves? And it's just Shatner's delivery. You could just tell he's like, oh, man, yeah, I agree. I wish we didn't have to do this, too. Well, Kelly, do you have any closing thoughts? As I mentioned with Amok Time and you've got the trio, you know, Kirk, Spock and McCoy, they all work together. This is, you know, largely everything centered around them as characters. But if it wasn't for Kirk and uh, Shatner portraying Kirk, his unflappable nature, how just how strong he played the captain. I don't think that the glue would have been there to hold those three together. I agree. And, and I wanted to give a quick note about um uh... Shatner and his acting too, because you know it gets knocked for uh, what he does in Star Trek, and I think that's really unfair. If you watch the show, 
and you watch Shatner, and I mean really watch him, he's actually doing a lot of subtle things. You know, in the first season, there are a lot of subtle facial expressions or undertones to his acting. In the second season, you can tell he's having some more fun and trying new things. And in fact, there are things like, you know, I, I love it when he's faced with absurdity. Yes. And he'll start to murmur. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And he's almost saying things under his breath because he's kind of exasperated. <laughs> and that was a choice by Shatner. And I love that. Here's another great example. And it's from The Trouble of, with Tribbles, as you mentioned earlier, when he's chewing out the men for the brawl on K7. And he then speaks to Scotty by himself. <laughs> and Scotty tells him why he threw the first punch. You know, listen to Shatner's voice and watch his face because they both go through these subtle changes and Shatner is showing us the range of emotions that Kirk is feeling and it's actually brilliant. It is. Watch it a couple of times, study his eyes and his face and what Shatner chooses to do, it's great. And just let me add this. If he is remembered... For the way Kirk spoke in some episodes, saying things with pauses, you know, then he actually made an acting choice, didn't he? That made his character memorable. And how many characters from the 1960s do you really remember? Right. Uh, I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, he he's remembered for that. Exactly. Wow. Exactly. So if you guys have a favorite Kirk moment, why don't you tell us? Just go to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash 70s Trek and let us know your thoughts. It was the moment that Star Trek was truly recognized as a cultural phenomenon. Next week, we talk about the Space Shuttle Enterprise. Thanks for listening to 70s Trek, an independent fan production. Join us next week as we explore more about the production, the actors, the producers, and the influencers of Star Trek in the lost decade of the 1970s on 70s Trek. 